Hello to everybody and welcome once again to uh, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition's hosted West African virtual workshop. I hope everybody can hear me now. Um, thank you for participating in today's workshop on advancing climate action in agriculture and food systems. This is being organized within the context of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition's agriculture initiative that has been uh, prioritizing on really enhance the ambition of 2030 NDCs by including actions to reduce short-lived climate pollutants from the agriculture sector. Uh, this is also part of our effort to create a group of leaders on the ground that can really help show the way forward and, and show some actionable solutions on the ground that can be taken by countries. I'd like to give you some technical tips before we begin. This is how to use Web WebEx. If you're experiencing any sound issues, please conduct a sound check. You can do that by pressing on the black circle with the three points to test your speaker and microphone and to also adjust the input level. At the end of the session, we will also have a question and answer session. So you will see that you will have uh, also a, a question and answer box where in picture one, you can see that you can direct your questions to all the panelists, to the host, presenter, or to a specific panelist. So we look forward to your, to your questions and to providing feedback to that. So we're very pleased now to begin the session with an introduction by our facilitator and, and key strategic partner representing CGIR uh, CCAFs, the CGIA, our research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security, represented by Lini Wallenberg. Thank you, Catalina, and welcome, everyone. As Catalina mentioned, the objective of the workshop is to raise awareness on what we can really do to advance climate action in the agriculture and food system sector. To that end, we'll be talking about, well, our panelists will be talking about NDC enhancement, country experiences drawing on three countries in particular nigeria ivory coast and senegal and other actions that can support countries in the region the context in west africa is that uh, emissions are moderate but still significant so in 2017 we had about 226 million tons of co2 equivalents of emissions in that year uh, and that was about 24% of Africa's total agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it is also about 4% of global agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. And to put that in context, that's about twice the level of aviation emissions globally. And the region is second after East Africa in terms of highest emissions in the continent. Agriculture contributes about a quarter of overall emissions in the region in West Africa. And the highest contributors are livestock, rice, and open burning, which align well with the mission of the CCAC and the interest in short-lived climate pollutants. The big challenge is though, of course, food security and the projection that by 2050, Africa's population um, and West Africa's population are expected to nearly double. And Nigeria is going to be, by all, by all scenarios, the third largest country in the world with about 700 million people. So how to achieve food security and reduce emissions. Next slide, please. Fortunately, the nationally determined contributions for the UNFCCC do highlight the role of agriculture in mitigation with most countries in West Africa, including an agricultural mitigation target, either explicitly or as part of an economy wide target with the exception of just two countries, Guinea-Bissau and Liberia. The African Development Bank noted at, from a review of the NDCs that in order to implement the NDCs, external finance, technology, and capacity, capacity building will be necessary. Next slide, please. If one looks a bit in more detail at the NDCs, you can see that the, the top sectors of interest again to the CCAC are there. So livestock and the methane emissions from livestock, six countries include livestock in their NDCs. And then for rice, we have an additional six countries. And you can see in this list that there are a host of other measures that have 
also, of course, been included. Next slide, please. And so for this session today, we have three segments. In the first segment of about half an hour, we have three speakers who will talk about NDCs and agriculture. In the second segment, we will look at country experiences more specifically for about an hour with seven speakers. And in the final segment, we'll hear from some global actors about what can be done to improve implementation. And, and then we'll have a period, we'll save all of our questions for the end for about 30 minutes. So it is my pleasure to introduce the first panel and uh, we'll start with Martial Bernou. Thank you. So Martial is the Natural Resources Officer for Climate Change Mitigation at FAO and I'll turn over to Martial. Thank you. Thank you, Lini. So I will give you a snapshot of what is uh, Climate and Clean Air Coalition and the, the work on agriculture uh, in that coalition. So I, I will just start to say that the Climate and Clean Air Coalition is a voluntary partnership of government, UN and intergovernmental organization, businesses, scientific institution, and civil society organization. Committed all together to improving air quality and protecting the climate through action to reduce short-lived climate pollutant. Uh, today, the global network is include 120 state and non-state partners, but also very, very important hundreds of local actors that are carrying out activities across all economic sectors on the ground of the different countries. Now, moving on that side, you, you can see on the agriculture initiative, that initiative supports countries specifically to identify an increasingly ambition in action policies and also targeting uh, all the different uh, food system. So not only the production angle, all the, the food system. And it's uh, guided by a priority to enhance food security, as Lini was mentioning, and livelihood. We demonstrate solutions to reduce the short-lived climate content that deliver quick benefit for the climate and air quality altogether. On agriculture, you can see the very relevant sector for uh, the coalition. So here are some more statistics. 24% uh, of all greenhouse gas are from uh, agriculture and forestry uh, overall, including land use change. But if we look uh, specifically on methane, on a black carbon, it's more or less 40%, a little bit less than half of all uh, global uh, anthropogenic uh, emissions. So that sector is uh, really important uh, for that. And here you have the five main areas uh, where the coalition is focusing, where the agriculture initiative is focusing, reducing methane from livestock, uh, including manure on the enteric fermentation, from paddy rice production, so again methane, also reducing black carbon from open burning. And we are just recently new area of work on integrated strategy for reducing methane together with black carbon from crop residues from bioenergy. Next slide, please. Okay. So here you have the, the major aim of uh, that uh, the agriculture initiative is really to catalyze the practice and policy changes that are needed now. So it's, uh, really the initiative is a catalyzer. And this is really important uh, even more today with the pandemic situation where we need really to, to build the, the back better the, the new economy of all countries, including on agriculture. And then after the initiative pass, I would say the mantle onto organizations such like, uh, but not uh, exclusively, uh, FAO and the World Bank with a mandate to expand and scale up uh, this work. And here you can see the four pillars, I will not read, but the four pillars basically is building political will, assisting countries with tools on capacity building, supporting a coalition on a enabling environment, on assembling evidence that enable large scale financing. So the scaling up aspect is also very, very important. Next slide. So I will move to more concrete uh, example. On as a whole, working together, for instance, with FAO, so I am from FAO, 
but we're working with other partners like New Zealand through the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Center or the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gas on the World Bank, on NGF, on other partners like uh, CCAP, for instance. The coalition is underscoring the mitigation potential of Antarctic methane and promoting cost-effective solution. On the, this work, for instance, has been done on beef production in South America, Argentina, Uruguay, and here you can see on dairy production system. So it has been done in East Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, in South Asia, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. And here you have an example that focus on West Africa, focusing on five countries, Benin, Burkina Faso, Gal, Mali, and Niger. And here you have two graphs that are extracted from the publication that uh, is in French, uh, uh, where most of the, this is the language most common of the five uh, countries here, that show that on, uh, on, on top you, you can see reference on intervention, so that the publication look at uh, uh, references for both pastoral uh, on top, on, uh, in the middle on agro-pastoral production system, and you can see, look at the yellow arrow, the potential of reduction that can be implemented in the different country in both pastoral and agro-pastoral production. So it's just an example. Please read the full uh, publication. You have the link below if you want to learn more. But it's to show that there is a real potential to be implemented and uh, scaled up uh, straightforward. Slide. So also concerning West African region, uh, there is a solution center that provides small scale funding for a specific goal. So here uh, the, the, it can be uh, helping government uh, in general of developing country to achieve a real outcome such as a policy or other action that can lead to real concrete emission reduction. So here you have uh, Nigeria that is a partner since uh, 2012. I'm here to scale up uh, ac uh, accelerated uh, short-lived climate pollution uh, reduction. The country prepared a national action plan where emission abatement strategy in the agriculture sector are a uh, key focus. Uh, in panel three, we will hear uh, more about this project from uh, Jessica McCarthy. So I will not enter into detail uh, here, but just for you uh, an example of uh, what we what the initiative did in that region. Uh, just to, to add, uh, so on, on the previous slide, that black carbon from burning has also been cited by APCC as a source of rain disturbance on patterns of all West Africa. So it's really important to have uh, action engaged in, in, in that region. Uh, another illustration you have uh, now here, uh, concerning an enhanced coordination at national level. So agriculture institutional strengthening coordination is also being supported in Nigeria and also in Vietnam, but uh, you can see also here, uh, to sustainably increase the level of action taken in each country to reduce uh, SLCP, so the short-lived climate pollutant from the agriculture sector by further promoting coordination and scaling up activities at the national level. So coordination uh, among all different um, ministries is really key to, to achieve concretely a goal. So this will be achieved by increasing general awareness regarding the, the, the pollutant on the, on the action taken increasing national awareness also on the specific impact of it on mitigation potential of the measure specifically in the agriculture sector, mobilizing interministerial collaboration and commitment to enhancing agriculture uh, short-lived climate pollutant mitigation in NDC, and I will uh, go back to, to that later on, on assessing new and sustainable financing to implement agriculture reduction program related to short-lived climate pollutant and to scale uh, or this at a region or national level. Next slide, please. Okay, I guess the next slide was just to, to, to yeah, it's a thank you, but just also to add that uh, here I have the hat of FAO as a really uh, supportive and a member of the initiative uh, under the coalition. 
but it was uh, when I was mentioning the need for coordination. So FAO, we are also uh, supporting uh, countries on uh, on their NDC with a, a lot of different actors and partners that are also engaged with uh, the coalition, for instance, the NDC partnership on all the members of the NDC partnership. And the, this is certainly the, the way to, to, to move uh, forward, uh, even more in a time you know, where we really need to tackle all different, uh, let's say, uh, challenges in front of, uh, of us in an holistic way. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm uh, open to answer any questions. Thank you, Marcel. If you don't mind, uh, for the attendees, we'll hold our questions until the end, but do feel free to enter questions into the um, question and answer box. Thanks. Great. So our next speakers uh, will talk about the um, NDC, an NDC study that they did. Uh, Laurel Pagorsch from Oxfam is the Associate Policy Advisor for Climate Change and Energy Team, and she'll be co-presenting with Asara Nifon. Uh, Sonogo from Oxfam, so regional platform in West Africa. Hi, thank you, and hi, everyone. Um, so I'd like to introduce a paper we at Oxfam and the World Resources Institute wrote together and released at the end of last year uh, with the generous support from ACAC. So the aim of this paper was to promote more ambitious and more directed inclusion of agriculture in the next round of NDCs and incorporate solutions that can help the agriculture sector be more sustainable, equitable, and resilient with reduced emissions. So in the first round of NDCs, uh, actually over 90% of countries mentioned agriculture in some way. Uh, many countries highlighted adaptation, mitigation as well. However, some lacked some key details of how to how targets would be achieved and missed some synergies uh, between mitigation and adaptation actions. So some significant gaps uh, remain, which also present opportunities as countries now update their NDCs. So we have a few me key messages from the paper. Uh, which you see, the first being looking at benefits of address agriculture in NDCs. Um, in doing so, there are opportunities to focus on adaptation and increase support for adaptation. So as we know, climate change is already impacting where and how our food is produced around the world with high temperatures, droughts, severe storms, already reducing crop yields. Uh, but also impacting food security and livelihoods of farmers and their families, which brings us to supporting farmers, especially vulnerable and small scale farmers, pastoralists and indigenous peoples who rely on agriculture and who really need to be included in planning and implementation processes as well. Policymakers can enhance their NDCs by choosing actions that both improve the lives and livelihoods of farmers and reduce emissions. This reduction of emissions is key because the agriculture sector contributes upwards of 13% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And reducing emissions can also be aligned with other development plans and strategies, including the sustainable development goals. NDCs are also being used to attract investment and finance. Uh, including the NDC Partnerships Climate Enhancement Package, and that's a $15 million fund being deployed to countries to help strengthen and implement NDC targets. Next slide, please. So the second main point of this paper is about embracing uh, solutions that are win-win for adaptation, mitigation, and farmers. And we highlight a range of 15 options that can be taken to reduce emissions and build resilience in the agriculture sector. These are actions are illustrated of, illustrative of the range of possibilities, recognizing uh, each action should be tailored and fit to the national context. And many are not feasible everywhere, but they can broadly be grouped into uh, the categories you see here. Uh, improved crop management, livestock management, 
broader land management, such as reduced use of fire, uh, utilizing agroecological practices like agroforestry and improved soil and water management. And lastly, more sustainable production and consumption measures like reducing food loss and waste and shifting diets. Next slide, please. So the final point of this work is that agriculture contributions in an enhanced NDC can be done in a variety of ways. Uh, those are listed here. Many countries have economy-wide targets and are working to strengthen those, but there are also options to include agriculture in an enhanced NDC in other ways. So that includes strengthen implementation measures, uh, a more inclusive process, strengthen governance and extension services, and ways to also streamline and mobilize financing. There are also specific agricultural policies and actions that can be taken, like uh, what I mentioned a bit earlier, um, that support both reduced emissions, build resiliency, and promote adaptation. And clarity and transparency of climate policies also can go a long way in facilitating an understanding of the benefits of those actions, especially if, they, if these include all stakeholders and are set up and tailored to the agricultural context of small scale farmers and the most vulnerable communities. So with that quick overview, I'd like to actually pass to my colleague Azara, uh, the West Africa Regional Lead for Food Justice. Uh, she'll take us through the foundations for action on enhanced, enhanced NDCs and the importance of setting up an enabling policy environment, highlighting the West African context. So with that, I will pass off to you, Azara. Thank you very much, uh, Lauren. And good morning or good afternoon to all participants. So be before going through the different foundation for action, let me come briefly back to the situation of climate change in the West African region. All African, West African countries are experiencing changes in rainfall distribution, an increase in temperature and the occurrence of extreme weather events. The impact of these meteorological and climatic phenomena are already being felt in various sectors of which the agri sector is particularly affected. The impacts of the agricultural sector on the agri and sorry, the impact on the agriculture sector, particularly on crop yield, farm income and livestock are considerable. According to two studies carried out in Burkina Faso, a 2.5 degree Celsius warming will lead to a 46% drop in agriculture income by 2019-2099, while a 7% drop in average annual rainfall would lead to a total loss of income for all farms. With a warming of 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius, drought and aridity will render between 40 and 80% of agricultural land unsuitable for growing maize, millet, or sorghum by 2030-2040. The reduction in agricultural production will put pressure on prices and directly affect the four pillars of food security, especially for women and the most vulnerable. So it's urgent for countries to target their greenhouse gas emission reduction, as well as to cope with uh, adaptation strategy with the current climate change issue. So we, as uh, my colleague Laurel said, the paper promotes win-win solution for adaptation and mitigation benefit, and those that work for farmers. The solutions are technical, but not only. Some principles should guide the action as the way to implement them. We call them the foundation for action. And It looks like we missed Asara. So I think we should, her connection is, is unstable. So Catalina, I suggest we continue to the next speakers. Okay, sure. Unless, uh, Laurel, would you like to find out the presentation? 
Sure. Oh, she's back. Asada, welcome back. We we missed we missed you. Ah, sorry. It's so, okay. okay. Uh, I, I will uh, resume at the, the first uh, foundation action, which is establishing policy coherence. So after scoping the national context to identify the production and consumption trends of livestock and crops, countries should work to establish the policy coherence between climate, agriculture, and trade policies, and a strong coordination among ministries towards the NDC's target. I want to illustrate the need of policy coherence building uh, by taking the example of the ECOWAS uh, policies. At the ECOWAS level, an agriculture and rural department committed to reach out the food security of the region and the reduction of food imports by developing the local food production and processing launch uh, by uh, 2016, the rice offensive, and by 2070, the milk offensive under the Regional Agriculture Policy ECOWAS. We aim to develop these uh, local value chains. In uh, 2018, a study commissioned by the Institution Department of Trade and Custom reported that the current com common external tariff offers little protection, protection to local agriculture and agri-food products, which undermine the, the development despite the investment made in the sector. This conclusion means that the agriculture target won't be achieved as long as the common external tariff, the expression of the regional trade policy remains unchanged. This highlights that the coordination for policy coherence between national adaptation plans and programs of action, by bi biodiversity programs or desertification combat programs, will be decisive for achieving the greenhouse gas emission reduction target. Another key, key foundation for success of the NDC's implementation process is involving all stakeholders identified in the national context. The experience of the ECOWAS regional milk offensive strategy and its priority investment program development could be a, a reference on how to involve all the diverse parties at the regional national level in the process of target identification, strategies to achieve them, achieve them and cost of the action, etc. The two years, two years process benefit to the quality of the program action as well as its durability. Because so many farmers, breeders, fishers are already facing climate change impact, this broad range of stakeholders has both information needs and knowledge to share regarding effective adaptation and mitigation measures. Asara, excuse me, uh, we are out of time. Would you mind wrapping up your, your presentation? Okay, my final uh, focus is on uh, identifying opportunities for support. The West African government should identify the support needs in each sector to make breeders, farmers, fishers more resilient to climate change. To will illustrate uh, quality livestock feeds can improve milk production in the salient countries of uh, West Africa, where milk is key for the resilience and food security of pastoralist communities. So investment and funding mechanisms to improve livestock feeds and support pastoralists to cope with climate change effects on the availability of grazing and water resources. We enable the 51 millions of pastoralists in the region to increase their livestock productivity and enhance the resilience to climate change effects. Next slide, please. So thank you. you can learn. I think we'll, we'll have to wrap up, but thank you. Thank you very much. You can you can uh, learn more about uh, this uh, when uh, you can then download the full discussion paper at uh, the free website uh, pages that are on the, the slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asara. Our next speakers are David Omotosho from John Davison Associates and Chris Malley from uh, SEI. 
in, in uh, Sweden. And they will be discussing an overview of a, a national action planning on SLC, SLCPs in Nigeria and a greenhouse gas mitigation analysis. Thank you very much. The Nigerian National short lived Climate Pollutant Planning Process was undertaken under the CCAC Supporting National Action and Planning on short lived Climate Pollutant Mitigation Initiative. This program was uh, coordinated by the Climate Change Department of uh, the Federal Ministry of uh, Environment. And the aims of the programs include identifying the major sources of short climate pollutants, air pollutants, and greenhouse gases. Also, the effort was to identify, evaluate, and privatize mitigation options to reduce short-lived climate pollutants in the country. And lastly, the effort was to develop an action plan to take forward priority short-lived climate pollutants mitigation measures. The exercise involved extensively all stakeholders in the nation, which includes NGOs, MDAs, CSOs, development partners, as well as uh, international uh, organization. And the final product, the plan was endorsed by the Federal Executive Council of Nigeria in May 2019. The next slide. The first step in the process involves the analysis of short-lived climate pollutant sources, which includes the inventory of dominant short-lived climate pollutants using the LIP integrated benefit calculator, activity, drag, uh, activity data derived from the nation, as well as uh, emission uh, factor. Dr. did quantify emissions of short-lived uh, climate pollutants, which include those for methane, black carbon, as well as for other pollutants and uh, other greenhouse uh, uh, gases. Data availability was a great uh, problem and a significant uh, limitation to the analysis that uh, we carried out. And as a result of that, the IPCC tier one methodologies was primarily used for uh, methane and GH uh, emission uh, analysis, while the EMP EEA tier one methodologies was used for air uh, pollutant emission uh, analysis. For data that we could not source locally, the FAO stat data uh, were used. The next slide. The results of uh, the uh, analysis consist of a uh, historical emission from agriculture. And uh, the results place uh, uh, agricultural emissions within the context of uh, uh, emission from other uh, source sources like residential, power, and uh, others. Uh, the research shows that agric makes a significant contribution to methane contribution uh, emissions in the nation. And also, as we could see, even from the slide before us, it shows that the uh, ammonia emissions also is a major source of uh, uh, the pollutants. And it is uh, of uh, note that this is the first time in the nation that these emissions uh, will be quantified. Next slide. Next slide. After the uh, analysis, 
the next effort centers on the, the identification of uh, mitigation measures and uh, the exercise in undertaking this revealed national policies, plans, and strategies in all sectors. It also revealed international reports such as uh, UNEP uh, WMO 2011 uh, assessment. And uh, on the basis of uh, this, or this being the foundation, uh, some characters were used to identify the measures. And this includes alignment with uh, sustainable development goals, alignment with ECOWAS renewable energy and energy efficiency agenda, as well as the better air quality agreement. Also part of uh, the criteria includes short-lived uh, climate pollutant emission reduction potential, alignment with national and sector priorities, operational feasibility, technical feasibility, funding feasibility, as well as uh, sociocultural acceptability. Next slide. In all, 22 mitigation measures were identified across eight sectors. And of these, four priority mitigation measures were identified in the uh, agricultural uh, sectors. And this include increased adoption of inter, uh, intermittent uh, aeration of paddy rice fields, reducing open feed burning of crop residue, promotion of aerobic, di uh, aerobic direction, then reduction of methane emission from uh, eccentric uh, 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 fermentation. And from the next slides, my partner, uh, Chris, will continue with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Amatosho. And I think the other thing to highlight there about the 22 mitigation measures that were identified and included in the national SLCP plan that were then endorsed is that those four mitigation measures identified in the agriculture sector were evaluated um, against a large number of mitigation measures across all source sectors. And the actions in the agriculture sector were found to be, you know, among the most effective to include in this SLCP plan, which covers all um, economic sectors. This graph here shows the result uh, or the estimated the estimated result of implementing all of those 22 mitigation measures in terms of their effectiveness at reducing black carbon emissions. And you can see from this graph that by 2030, implementing all of those mitigation measures was estimated to reduce black carbon emissions by um, about 80% in 2030 compared to the baseline uh, value. The majority of that benefit comes from actions um, to reduce the use of biomass for cooking in the residential sector. But a significant proportion of that um, of that benefit also comes from the agriculture sector from reducing the burning of agricultural residues. And I think, um, you know, reflecting on what some previous speakers have said about the need to align NDCs with development priorities, Reducing black carbon emissions and emissions of other air pollutants, which have a direct impact on health, is one way to anchor an enhanced NDC in achieving local development benefits through reductions in air pollution exposure and improvements in health. And I think that's shown here in, in Nigeria's SLCP plan. On the next slide, we see the um, the benefits for methane reductions. There's a slightly lower reduction compared to black carbon, but still by 2030, the actions that were identified in Nigeria's national SOCP plan were estimated to reduce um, methane emissions by approximately 50%. And about half of this benefit comes from actions in the agriculture sector. The other half comes predominantly from actions to reduce methane emissions from the oil and um, from the oil and gas sector. So there are a substantial component of this national SOCP plan, which uh, Dr. Bapa and colleagues in Nigeria are going to talk about later, comes from taking actions in the agricultural sector. Um, the, the main conclusions, I think, from the analytical process that was gone through in Nigeria 
to provide the inputs um, to the national SLCB plan, which is shown on the next slide, uh, that there was a substantial um, uh, limitation of data in, in a lot of sectors, including agriculture, to be able to do a more detailed integrated air pollution and climate change analysis. And that building capacity in national institutions to do this analysis is, is really useful and, and can help to uh, bridge those data gaps, but also for this analysis to be sustained and updated over time to monitor the implementation of these actions. And as um, uh, Dr. Bapper and, and others are going to talk about, the assessment, the, 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 the quantification of the emissions and the emission reductions and the benefits of these actions need to be linked to a formal national planning process to then feed in and influence um, decision making. Finally, before we finish on, on the next slide, I, I just wanted to highlight an, an initiative that the CCAC is undertaking that could help to bridge some of these data gaps and to facilitate um, capacity building on integrated assessment of air pollution and, and, and climate change in Africa. In, in 2019, the CCAC um, agreed to fund a um, assessment of air pollution, climate change and development in Africa that is going to uh, assess how development in Africa can proceed while at the same time limiting increases in air pollution and its impacts on health and understanding the potential to limit climate change in the near term and what implications that has for adaptation in Africa. And on the final slide, um, uh, I just want to highlight that as part of that, we will be undertaking a, uh, a modelling exercise for all economic sectors, including the agriculture sector, with a team of, of international and, and um, African uh, modellers um, that will develop national scale models of emissions for all economic sectors, including the agricultural sector. Um, that could be used as the basis for national planning in the future. And if anybody here is interested in getting involved in that assessment, please feel free to contact me or, or the CCAC Secretariat, and we'd be very happy to, to work with you on it. Um, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank, thank you, you to all of our speakers. I'll now hand over to Catalina Echeverri to facilitate the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh to the segment one panelists. It was all very interesting to hear from you. Now I would like to present everybody to the second part of the event, which will showcase country examples from West Africa that are uh, that can provide some examples on how more ambitious action across agriculture and food systems can help achieve the Paris Agreement's goals for addressing climate change. And we have um, some special speakers today with a highlight on Nigeria, who has endorsed a national action plan on SLCPs and agriculture measures, followed by Ivory Coast and Senegal. So without further ado, I present you to Bala Bapa, the CCAC SNAP Implementation Coordinator from the Federal Ministry of Environment, Nigeria. And I would like to remind panelists that uh, we are keeping time. So thank you for, for keeping to your allotted time. Please go ahead, Bala. Bala, I believe you might be muted. Please, please begin. Hello, Bala and colleagues at the Federal uh, Ministry of Agriculture. I've just unmuted you. If you could please try speaking. We hear you. Please go ahead. Are you? We can now. We can now hear you. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay, Bala, yeah, I'm um, much of what I wanted to say uh, has been highlighted by my colleagues. 
Okay. Um, so what I wanted to present and say by my colleagues, Doctors uh, Omoto Show and Chris, uh, all the same, they have uh, spoken about the um, uh, national pro uh, planning process, and uh, I will maybe take us through the institutional strengthening, stakeholder coordination, and the implementation of the national action plan and the strategies to mainstream the national action to the national development process and the funding for the implementation of the SLCP projects country and the efforts to uh, 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 entrench sustainability. So my presentation uh, will uh, include um, the key action included in the national action plan the overview of the emission sources and uh, priority mitigation measures, which has been highlighted by Dr. Omoto show, but I will still mention some few things that uh, have been omitted. Then the process of developing the policy briefing that is linking the SLC issues together with the uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, as well as the Ministry of uh, Environment. Then I will highlight uh, some aspects of the Nigerian agricultural policy brief, and then the next steps in the implementation of the uh, national action plan. So uh, next slide. So um, the overview of the national action plan. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, much has been said about the process, but uh, we signed the PCA, and uh, the implementation of the SNAP started in June 2015 with the appointment of the national focal point. Then a coordination office was established in the Ministry of uh, Environment, uh, liaising with stakeholders, the stakeholders including um, M, uh, NGO, CBOs, and development partners, as well as inter international development partners. Then uh, we inaugurated the advisory and the task force group, the uh, key stakeholders that were identified. Then we proceeded with a regular consultative and then um, the, SNAP, the SNAP initiative provided a platform where we uh, interacted and then uh, proceeded to uh, develop the national action plan and we are currently at the implementation stage. Uh, Nigeria is active in several uh, CCAC initiatives, including oil and gas, SNAP, agriculture, um, uh, municipal waste, health, HFCs, diesel and um, to some extent bricks and um, we developed the national action plan as I earlier mentioned uh, with the participation of the uh, contributions of the stakeholders both um, uh, MDS uh, the uh, and non-governmental organizations and then uh, the uh, international development partners participated but uh, we are um, the coordination was by our Partners, which are the Stockholm Environment Institute, IUPA, and uh, UNEP uh, Regional Office for Africa. So, as mentioned earlier by Dr. Omoto Show, the plan was endorsed by our national, uh, by the Federal Executive Council of Ministers, and it is now currently under implementation. So, the next slide is um, the key actions included in the national action plan included our strategy of establishing uh, desk offices in the MDAs to coordinate the SLCP issues for sustainability. And we also, you know, mainstreaming of the SLCP uh, mitigation measures into our national development uh, process, which is the um, uh, economic growth and recovery plan, which is um, being uh, developed by the uh, Ministry of Finance, Budget and National Planning, and we are participating actively in it. And uh, we hope that uh, the uh, measures will be uh, included in our uh, national development process. Then uh, another strategy we adopted was the uh, emphasis on budgetary provisions for SSP projects in MDA, in, in, in MDA budgets so that uh, uh, SSP projects will be funded and uh, implemented which will result into reduction of uh, emissions. Then uh, there are some projects that are funded by our national budget, and there are some that uh, will have to be funded by um, uh, national donors. And we are working closely with um, the CCAC, the Agric Initiative. We have identified areas and we have written some uh, project concept notes, which are currently under consideration, and we hope to get funding 
for some of the projects that will require international uh, funding. Uh, the uh, next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, identified uh, four uh, mitigation uh, measures in uh, which will include a reduction of methane emissions from enteric fermentation. This will entail the implementation of actions such as improved feed and husbandry practices. Uh, all these measures, I have my colleagues here who are specialists who have been working together in the development of the National Action Plan and the implementation, and currently working closely with the CCAC to uh, implement the measure. We're talking about uh, uh, activities as regards to a reduction of SLCPs in the agri sector. Uh, the second um, measure we identified is the promotion of um, anaerobic digestion from manure or of livestock and poultry. And um, the third one is the reduction of often field burning from crop. All this will be highlighted by my colleagues who are seated with me. And then the final one is the increased adoption of intermittent aeration in the uh, flooded rice to reduce emission of uh, methane. This will also be highlighted by my colleague, Dr. Fatima. Then the next um, the, we'll talk, is talking about uh, the process we adopted in developing uh, the policy briefings, which we try to link with the uh, SLCP measures in the Nigerians uh, uh, SLCP uh, agricultural policies. So we had uh, consultations uh, with the, the Federal Ministry of uh, Agriculture and Rural Development and the Ministry of Environment. So the departments that were involved were the Department of uh, Climate Change and Rural Development, the Department of Animal Husbandry, and the Department of Veterinary and Pest Control Services, as well as the, the Department of Agriculture, the Rice Value Chain Desk Office. So we all met and uh, reviewed the existing agricultural policies and programs currently under implementation as it relates to the change, uh, climate change and SSCP emission mitigation. Develop strategies for implementing the four approved um, SLCP mitigation measures and uh, identify uh, some SLCP mitigation projects, which are some are currently under implementation in the ministries, and the others we are working to get support to implement from international donor part partners to implement uh, some of them. So um, uh, uh, we also, together with the Stockholm Environment Institute, developed a monitoring and evaluation framework, which will be um, subsumed into the national MRV for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Stockholm Environment Institute and is currently available and uh, we are going to uh, subsume it into the national MRV plan. So the next um, slide, these are the highlights of the uh, project, Nigerian project brief in which uh, we uh, reviewed the existing policies. There is a policy of agriculture policy 2016 to 20, uh, uh, to 2020 document, which is uh, tagged the green alternative, which focuses agriculture as a business. So uh, the emphasis is uh, in agriculture uh, this time around as a business, both involves the large scale, medium and uh, small scale farmers, uh, which will be you know uh, provided with um, um, financial, support, um, agri extension services, inputs, and all that is required to improve agricultural production in Nigeria, including um, the value chain approach. And agricultural linkages with other sectors. We are working on mainstreaming climate change into agricultural planning and development. And uh, this are uh, emphasizing the climate smart agriculture, which is uh, supported by FAO to increase productivity, build resilience and reduce emissions, uh, which the uh, emphasis on specific, measurable, achievable, uh, re reliable and timely uh, activities. Um, this will be promoted through uh, agricultural extension and other uh, measures that uh, the Ministry of Agriculture is pursuing. And, um, uh, the implementation of the approved SLCP plan agricultural measures, as I earlier mentioned, the strategy is to uh, identify those projects, promote their inclusion in the national budget, and then you know uh, some of them that cannot be implemented with the 
budget, uh, we are sourcing uh, funding from international donor partners. So um, that is uh, as regards the highlights of the agricultural policy brief. And uh, the next step, which um, the strategies we are adapting to uh, the Department of Climate which hosted the Development of the National Action Plan together with the MDAs and in this particular aspect, the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, which spearheaded the identification and uh, recommendation of the mitigation measures and are currently involved in the uh, implementation of the measures to reduce SLCPC, the agricultural uh, sector. So we are working with the Ministry of Budget and National Planning, as earlier mentioned, to mainstream the national action plan into the development process and also ensure budgetary provision to MDS for uh, SLCP uh, mitigation. Other measures that will require international support, we are working on it with the uh, CCAC to uh, help source funding for the implementation. And we have developed concept notes and are currently being considered by the CAC and uh, some will be forwarded to other development partners. And uh, we also work of um, uh, environment to, uh, and uh, we have achieved um, uh, a, a inclusion of the SLC measures into the revised NDC, which uh, the, uh, the exercise that uh, has just been, uh, uh, is going on, but uh, we have um, made sure that the SLC measures have been included in the revised uh, NDC, which will attract uh, NDC partnership and uh, the CAP and, and, and the other implementers. Um, so uh, this is so far uh, with the major strategies we are uh, considering in the we are currently implementing to reduce SLCPs generally, but in particular in the uh, agri. Um, I will stop here and uh, my colleagues will talk about their activities in their respective areas uh, as you will hear very soon. Um, thank you, Katarina. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Bala. We ne now have the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, uh, Cyril Bicom. If you could please present and keep within uh, four minutes. We are a bit over time. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hello, good afternoon from my end here. My name is Fayabo, representing Mr. Biko, who is in the schools right now. Next slide, please. Catalina, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. I'm on the land use and climate change slide. Okay. Well, thank you. So, from uh, what is involved, we are from the presentation here now. We're defining what we mean by land use. The definition of land use means the management and modification of natural environment into built environments such as field, pasture, and settlement. Or alternatively, you can also define it as the arrangement activities and input people undertaking in certain land cover to produce change or maintain it. Agricultural use in Nigeria can be categorized into uses as arable crop production, forestry related, grazing land, fish pond, tourism. The agricultural and forestry land use are followed all over the world. Most times, when you see it, you find out that agriculture contributes a lot into emission of GHG into the environment. So likewise in Nigeria, we also, agricultural sector also contributes a large chunk of it into the environment. We contribute GHG a lot into the environment. And that's why we're having the 60% agriculture in agri sector of Nigeria. So this also contributes to issue of climate change. You can see also highlighted issue of climate change as relates to agriculture in as much as you, you uh, as much as emit GHG will always increase. So you should expect
So you should expect that your once your temperature increases, you expect that your GA generation is becoming higher. So please, next slide. Next slide. Yes, I am on the conclusion slide. Yes, okay. Um, I hear you. I am on the conclusion slide. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So on the conclusion side, we're talking of reduction of open burning. Yeah, for my own department, I'm from the agricultural and Atlantic, uh, department. We concentrate more of open burning and deeper. Implement for us to reduce the effect of open money. One to that number one, which is marking a vulnerable area. Yes, yes, yes. To embark into, into the marking of those vulnerable areas where they carry out a lot of open burning activities, so that we we have we sensitize them and. So the number two now is promotion of agricultural waste and residue for energy. This is from by the time you you sensitize and talk to them is hello Mustafa. I'm very sorry. It's um the Miss Yabo. It's okay. Yes, the connection is the. Hello? The connection is very bad. Uh, I can, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, your connection is very bad. If you could sit closer to the microphone. Hello, your connection is now? quite bad. If you could please sit closer. Can you hear me? Yes, this That's is much better. Now? Yes, much better. We, If you could please conclude uh, the presentation. Thank you, I hear you better. Hello? I hear you well. If you could please conclude your portion of the presentation. Okay, uh, unfortunately, we seem to have lost uh, Mustafa, who was presenting on behalf of Cyril. So I, will, I will move on to the next. Um, presenter who is Hakim. Hello, I can now hear if you could please um, present okay. so Mr. Hakim Ibilad. These are the action plans we plan to implement to reduce open burning as, as regards to agricultural activities on the field. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, and we regret the connectivity issue. Uh, from as well from Nigeria, we have uh, Hakim Ibiladi from the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Rural Development. Welcome, Hakim. You may now begin to present the SLCP actions identified um, as part of the Department of Animal Husbandry Services. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Hakim. Please go ahead. Yeah, they can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, my name is Hakim. I'm from the Department of Animal Husbandry Services, the Red Minister of Agriculture. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to talk about what the department is doing to, to mitigate the effect of uh, greenhouse gas and uh, SLCPs. Um, in Nigeria, we are looking forward to reducing for milk and some other animal products. And this will automat automatically lead to increased production on our part. At the same time, we have to be prepared for associated uh, uh, GHG and SLCP emission. And uh, we are through uh, capacity building, 
I mean, raising the capacity of our farmers. Okay. So you can go to the next slide, please. The next slide. Hello. Okay. So we want to do this through what you call the cattle breed improvement program. And the cattle breed program is going to be carried out using artificial insemination to have more uh, cattle. We want to use the food semen and um, the assumption is that more people, more farmers, will be interested in this uh, program. So what we now do alongside capacity building is to introduce what we call the uh, standard operation procedure for the farmers so that right from the beginning, they know exactly how to mitigate the GHG and uh, SLCPs. Again, we are training them on how to use input so that rumination period will be reduced in the in cattle. At the same time, we go into good animal boundary practices and uh, harvesting of pasture at early stage. Next slide. Then we we as well talk about the processing of crop used for uh, for for our ruminants generally. We believe we can reduce stress. I mean, oh, it's the stress on uh, having to burn the crop residues. So we now convert them to animal feed through feed blocks and uh, crop residues uh, processing and utilization uh, methods. Together with uh, 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 construction of uh, environment friendly houses for sheep and goats and cattle, we install anaerobic uh, digesters for cooperative farmers, for cooperative cattle farmers, so that we reduce uh, emission, that's methane emission into the environment. Then we raise their capacity on careful aesthetic fertilizers. Yes. Okay. On. For beef and using your genetic equipment, that's we are now starting to are using more like animals. And uh, those ones that stay trapped in the minority period, then we modify systems of production in order to build a smaller carbon footprint that's with less emission, that's more energy requirement and fewer waste uh, production. Then we breed more resistant crops uh, and uh, pastures for dairy consumption. That's more resistant to droughts, disease. Then we implement environmentally friendly and more effective farming practices. If we are we adopt uh, housing systems that reduce emission, just like the elevated goat, uh, goat house I talked about. I think uh, in the uh, well, I'm linking up with the CCAC to help in. Uh, uh, emission. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Thank you very much, Hakim. Uh, okay. Uh, the presentation will oh. well on uh, oh. having to follow the common financial services. It's really different. And uh, focusing more on the business of disease uh, control, we believe with uh, better production methods. Excuse me, Anima. I'm sorry, uh, uh, I apologize. The, the... Uh, uh, process, especially in the uh, that solid uh, waste, so it doesn't affect the uh, environment. Because uh, waste 
pour avoir ce genre de révolution, parce qu'on est dans une sorte de cell city à des kibits, des tas qu'on va se juste à des... So, if you emission, this is the Department of Veterinary Services. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you very much. And uh, apologies, uh, the connectivity was bad. But we will now, um, I understand you were presenting on behalf of Dr. Elimi, and we have the, the slides available uh, because they were at the end. But we will now move on to Dr. Fatima Aliyu, um, Deputy Director and Head of the Cereals Division from the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. Welcome, Dr. Fatima, if you can please. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. From the right back gender, social development. And rice is the strategic food for achieving food nutrition. Our total demand for rice now is 7 million metric tons of new rice. Yeah. based on that kg per capita consumption. Presently, 70% of total rice production is under irrigated ecology. And it is well documented rice production and burning of rice is a major contribution to greenhouse emissions. So in Nigeria, we took that as consideration when developing the National Rice Development Strategy 2020-2030. So we included measures for the promotion of alternative wet and dry irrigation methods to their displacement. Indeed, we took a lot of um, measures. We included a lot of measures for climate smart agriculture because we are concerned about climate change and what is happening and right the major uh, casualty of all this. So we took a lot of things to consideration. But we added this uh, A, of UG, uh, UGI displacement, as well as the duplication of rice cost, using it for energy and for animal feed as well. And then we also are in the process of establishing our own sustainable rice platform in Nigeria. Um, as we all know, the sustainable rice platform is a global platform for rice producers at the Majorly to take into consideration um, the environment in the production of uh, rice. So, GIZ are presently helping us in setting up that uh, our platform. So, all these are activities are expected to contribute to the reduction of greenhouse emissions from rice production in the country. To also result in sustainable rice production for enhanced food and nutrition security as well as the clean environment. And we hope that CAC will support us in this activity for us to achieve our objective in the rice sector, which is a food security, self sufficiency rice production for enhanced food security, and also contribute to Nigeria's achievement of the that will lead to sustainable development goals of no hunger, poverty reduction, clean environment, gender equality, and partnership for progress. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fatima, and to the colleagues uh, at the Nigerian Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. Oh, um, Dr. Alimi's presentation was already delivered, and we will make sure to share those. Now, I would like to introduce uh, Benjamin Brida, the CCAC National Focal Point and Coordinator from the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development from Cote d'Ivoire. So, welcome, Benjamin. Please, please begin your presentation. Okay. Thank you, Catalina. So, today I'm going to introduce you to the implementation of agriculture FSP measures under the National Action Plan. On SLCC and its linkage 
to the end of the process, but it's like Okay, so uh, just uh, before starting, I would like to give you a bit of background of this uh, plan, uh, which was developed uh, between 2015 and 2019 by the Ministry of uh, Environment uh, uh, and uh, the, the development of this plan was led by the FACP for Nation Unit. It was approved uh, last year in November, and the plan was to do an evaluation of different policies and measures in terms of the effectiveness and uh, uh, also um, targeting uh, different uh, FACP, mainly black carbon emissions. Uh, the key sources set for cover by this one are the residential sector, transportation, agricultural work, and oil and gas. Next slide. And uh, the plan actually uh, identified uh, 16 different measures included uh, uh, in this uh, plan, which was agreed uh, in consultation with uh, the stakeholders. Eight measures of this plan focus on black carbon and the, uh, the eight other major target uh, measures. The overall uh, plan uh, will black carbon emissions by 60% in 2030 and 80% in 2040. For methane emission, we can reach uh, a 34% reduction by 2030 and at least uh, half, uh, we can have, uh, we can reduce by half the, the methane emission by 2040. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So here I'm giving you an overview of uh, the measures among the 16 measures that target uh, uh, agricultural sectors. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, a measure that is targeting black carbon within the agricultural sector is uh, to reduce the open burning on the field. Uh, and we have other two measures that target uh, methane, mainly the extension of the status within the country and also the extension of the control of the methane from livestock. And for each measure, we also, during this plan, identify the ambition with the, the the status of the measure, the priority uh, of this measure at the national level, as well as different stakeholders that should be involved in uh, the implementation and leading the measure. Uh, you can notice here that uh, the the, uh, uh, the measure related to AWD is one of the key uh, components of this uh, plan in terms of uh, agricultural sectors because it's directly linked to the national rice production uh, strategy, uh, which aim at uh, reaching self in rice. And uh, from the discussion with the stakeholders, it was agreed that uh, by, by targeting 90% of rice cultivation uh, practice to AWG, we can reach a significant reduction in we can meet at the same time the target of um, self efficiency in rice production, but also uh, we can reduce the significant amount of methane from the sector. Let's go to the next slide to see how all these measures within the sector will impact the emission from the agricultural sector. Uh, so, here we can read at least percent of the carbon uh, which is uh, mainly, uh, which mainly results from the, the implementation of uh, uh, the reduction of open burning measures, and also at least uh, 26 to 28 percent reduction of methane emission from the high platform sector, uh, mainly from uh, rice cultivation, but also uh, livestock. Next slide, please. Okay, move implementation of this plan at the national level. Uh, as part of the SNAP, the, the SNAP initiative, the phase two of the SNAP initiative, we identified three main areas of uh, implementation for the plan. The first one is uh, uh, to strengthen the overall coordination at the national level, uh, which is going to have uh, 
uh, exempt implementation committee for the plan and also we make sure the alignment of the plan, the implementation of the plan with the national policy framework and the situation of the provision. Uh, the second uh, area of work will be to increase uh, our action with the different sector by supporting the implementation with strong analysis, developing common proposal and also starting mitigation action, which is really important, uh, particularly for uh, the progress and the, the, the commitment to the making at the national level. And also one important area is the integration into a cost cutting plan, mainly the national development plan, climate change plan, and also air quality plan. Moving now further into uh, the implementation, talking about uh, the agricultural sector itself, next slide please. Uh, based on all, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, different area of work and uh, activities that will identify agencies as the uh, main area of implementation. Uh, of course, the, the, the funding aspect of FACP measure was one of the key, uh, one of the key actions to be implemented. And uh, this will be done actually through uh, the development of a uh, very consistent uh, funding proposal that should support the implementation of the action. And one uh, funding proposal that was actually developed uh, last year uh, with the support of the, uh, the household energy initiative and also the agricultural initiative. The CPSC was actually to, to foster the implementation of social climate policies in the agricultural sector uh, using uh, uh, right to review, but also uh, try to link uh, that. Uh, really due to uh, a pathway from, from waste to energy. And this is uh, one of the key proposals that is actually under uh, serious consideration, both of the CPC, but also uh, with uh, other donors, such as the FAA. And uh, one uh, key area of work for the implementation also is the integration of the FACP measures in the CK, uh, NDC, and other agricultural sector plans. And uh, for the for the NDC revision, we are actually uh, quite advanced in, in, in this area. We we got uh, we were able to secure uh, a several support to work uh, for, on that most likely. And uh, we are actually working uh, with the support of SEO for the revision of the actual sector, but also we have one. Uh, critical support with the NDC partnership type initiative to maintain FACP in all the economic sector, including the agricultural sector. And uh, as part of those uh, two uh, areas of work, we are actually um, working together. All the, the two uh, working teams are uh, actually working in strong consultation to make sure that uh, the next version of the NDC of Code of Law will have. Uh, Highly or clearly implementable uh, FLCP measure highlighted in the paper, which is key actually for, for the implementation of, of, of this plan uh, in the next year. And during also the development of the plan, one aspect that was really important, uh, that I think to be really important for us in particular, was the link between uh, the planning process and the research that is going on. Uh, we were able to, uh, during this plan, achieve uh, some. This result by in integrating um, up to date research that was going on uh, at the University of Africa. And we, on this cycle of, uh, of planning, we are also uh, aiming at integrating all the research on the impact of ozone uh, that is uh, being undertaken at the Social Center on Climate Change and Biodiversity in to our estimates to support. Uh, uh, the, 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 the strong analysis and implementation of, of, of this one. And uh, with that, I think I will thank you all, and uh, you can have more informa information of this plan on the CPC website. And um, thank you for giving the opportunity of highlighting this. Thank you very much, uh, Benjamin, for your presentation. 
I am now pleased to present Yata. Um, He's from the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development in Senegal, and he will also be sharing his country experience. Please welcome Lamine. Please go ahead. And I remind participants to enter any questions they might have in the in the question box. Thank you. We'll be focusing on the uh, agriculture sector. And as you know, agriculture is very close to land use uh, sector, so it will be a cross cutting uh, intervention. Thank you. Uh, just to present Senegal, uh, it is located in the western extremity of the uh, Africa continent. But what is very important to keep here is uh, Senegal is part of the Sahelian uh, uh, region. Uh, this region, it, uh, which is characterized by uh, very hard ecological conditions, in which uh, economical uh, growth and social well-being have to be faced uh, diverse constraints, uh, such like uh, erratic rainfalls, high temperature, and uh, water scarcity, uh, with important impact, negative impact on uh, livestock and crop production. It is also important to know that the population is about uh, 16 million and uh, about 70% of this population livelihoods are rely on uh, the primary sector, uh, especially agriculture, forestry and uh, uh, fisheries and uh, also uh, livestock. Uh, the actual development vision, uh, what we call it the Plan Senegal Emergent, uh, vision is to achieve economic uh, growth and social well-being throughout agriculture. And it's uh, we are now the phase two is uh, running. And in this phase, uh, phase two, we are just going for green growth. And this green growth will be go throughout uh, uh, agroecology and uh, reforestation. Next uh, slide, please. Yes, from this ambitious uh, vision of Senegal to achieve uh, a green growth. Do you hear me? Hello? Perfectly. Yes, Lamine, we hear okay. you well. Okay. okay, thank you. From this ambitious vision of the government to achieve a green growth and uh, social well-being, we have uh, to face and to to face uh, some constraint we have in terms of land degradation because agriculture, livestock, and uh, forestry are rely on land use, and in Senegal we have this problematic uh, even in the remaining countries of the Sahelian region uh, land degradation. And now uh, we have just uh, to be reducing, stopping, and reversing this multifaceted phenomena of land degradation uh, in next 15 years because our development uh, targets is uh, about uh, 2035. And then in the government, we are just conducting a holistic and uh, integrated approach uh, to face uh, land degradation uh, in, in Senegal. As you can see, in different uh, ecological region of Senegal, we are facing uh, land degradation uh, due to, water, uh, to salinization, water erosion, and wind erosion. And this is very important uh, problematic uh, if we are going to uh, achieve our, to fulfill our commitment uh, in terms of uh, zero hunger, in terms of sustainable development goals, UNCCD and climate action, such as uh, the work undergoing on the Coronivia joint work on agriculture. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. And uh, in this, I'm just going to share uh, progress made in uh, the government side to create an enabling environment that aim to catalyze interventions and funding uh, in terms of land degradation. 
and you, you, we are going just uh, to be interested by two components of these uh, efforts, uh, such as institu institutional arrangement and policy area. In institu uh, institutional arrangement, we have uh, a national pedology institute and uh, the directorate in charge of uh, water, forest, and soil conservation that are committed by the government to take uh, uh, interventions in the area of land degradation. And in uh, we are just with uh, the second phase of our uh, economic growth uh, policy. Uh, we set up a national reforestation and the grid green world agencies, which is going to implement uh, some activity uh, to restore uh, vegetation and land for soil fertility and to improve uh, productivity in the agriculture area. In terms of policy, we have uh, since uh, 2004 set up a holistic law, uh, agro silver pastoral orientation law, to keep a comprehensive uh, interventions amongst uh, the primary sector in terms of livestock, agriculture, land use sector to have uh, a development, uh, a green development in this sector. And we have also set up another policy, a national strategic investment framework for sustainable land use management, which identifies the problematic of land degradation, causes, solutions, and stakeholders, how we can go with synergy to tackle in a sustainable manner this course. And in climate change area also, we have set up, uh, identified agriculture as a priority intervention uh, sector uh, with the first uh, national uh, adaptation, national uh, action plan for climate change adaptation with uh, three main programs, and one is a flagship program on agroforestry. We have also uh, a national uh, agriculture and food security investment plan when we have to, uh, we have mainstream it. Uh, climate change activities in, agri uh, in agriculture. And here, what is important to see is uh, Senegal is uh, one country uh, where uh, fertilizers use level is very low. It is about uh, 8 to 15 kilograms per hectare. Uh, to increase uh, our productivity, we are not going for uh, reducing uh, fertilizers use. It is not the option of the government, but what we can do here is to increase uh, soil organic carbon throughout uh, some good practices, agroecology and climate smart agriculture. It is just to balance what we are going to have as emissions in agriculture sector by sequestration in soil or organic uh, in soil uh, organic carbon. Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, besides the government effort, we have also uh, a very important uh, multi-stakeholder dynamic in going in Senegal with uh, civil society, farmers' organizations, and uh, financial and technical partners working uh, to support the government establishing uh, relevant policies to integrate an agroecology transition for climate action in Senegal. And this uh, dynamic uh, uh, just provide a report uh, submitted to the government to have clear actions, actionable on the ground to achieve climate action in upcoming uh, decades. And it's go through to advocation, lesson and good practices uh, sharing, coordination, synergies, studies on the potential of agroecology done by uh, FAO with some uh, partners, uh, which show the potential of agroecology on uh, implementing coronavirus joint work and other climate action into agriculture. And another option is to go through farmer school because uh, capacity building and going with farmers is very key if we want to uh, achieve climate action in agriculture. So technologies, research policies, finance, and synergy are very core if we want to go uh, for uh, 
ag uh, agroecology transition. Next slide, please. Here, I'm just sharing some information about our national uh, determined contribution in which we have uh, some commitment in five mitigation sector and uh, agriculture in uh, and land use uh, land use change is another sector agriculture is accounting for about 45% uh, of national emissions and on that senegal have some commitment on mitigation in the agriculture area and when you see here at the uh, down area here uh, it's the emission of agriculture and where you see livestock sector is accounting for about 61% of sectoral emissions and rice cultivation is accounting for about 5%. And uh, for mitigation options uh, in our NDC, we are going for three main components, compost use, agroforestry, and to promote the system of rice intensification. I hear this kind of uh, option in the Nigeria uh, presentation. And the system of rife intensification is uh, very climate friendly and going for resilience because uh, for alternating wetting and drying in rice plots, we are going to reduce significantly uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, we are going uh, also to uh, save seeds by uh, to reduce the number of seeds or the quantity of seed used by farmers by 90% and to reduce also uh, inputs such as uh, fertilizers and pesticides and uh, to reduce by uh, the time uh, emission due to the methane but also emission due to fertilizers and at least uh, the system is uh, going to increase yields by uh, 56 to 86 uh, percent uh, the number is from uh, the flagship uh, s3 project, the West Africa S3 project. And as you see in this diagram, uh, if we compare the S3 uh, yields with uh, the statu quo, how we call it, uh, the business as usual in uh, rice cultivation, you see that uh, this system is very important in terms of adaptation because it is going to increase uh, rice productivity by uh, reducing greenhouse gas emission. In our NDC, it's one core uh, option we identify. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the way forward, after defining our uh, NDC options in terms of mitigation in agriculture sector, it is only options. We do not uh, yet have a, a strategy of intervention to see how we can uh, have a very relevant programs, programs that can work in any uh, agroecology region. So the way forward will be what we are going to do is uh, to transform our NDC option to bankable program and to see how we can uh, be using the potential of its agroecology region. Also developing a funding strategy for our NDC uh, with uh, bankable programs. Uh, the capacity building will be very important and to how to see how we can uh, enhance our m and &E systems uh, to be in coherence with uh, what the NDC need in terms of uh, MRV. Uh, to see also how we can set up a very important coordination and synergy uh, system and developing partnership uh, for the implementation of our NDC. And the, uh, the last one will be to develop uh, research and capacity building. As we know, uh, in the climate change area, uh, even the government side, uh, the farmer side and partner side, we have to have a, a very comprehensive uh, uh, intervention option and to develop synergies to, uh, to success our climate action. In, uh, as a side, in terms of uh, adaptation, we are developing our national adaptation plan in agriculture sector, and we go through to studies to have some scientific evidence uh, for intervention uh, on the ground. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, the second plus, uh, slide is about, it is a transition in another sector. Uh, 
uh, as uh, Nigeria saw it, uh, we have uh, a national uh, air quality monitoring center in Senegal, uh, which is uh, based in the Ministry of Environment, Environment but working with uh, the meteorology agents and health sector to monitor the quality of air and giving some advice uh, for uh, when uh, the air quality is going to be bad or getting worse uh, for action. And we are working with the health department and meteorology action to uh, provide uh, some built-in of information. And the center is also working on setting up uh, uh, one, uh, facilitating the establishment of an observatory observatory on air quality. And I, I, I think that it is very important in the climate and air quality coalition uh, to see how we can uh, have a, a partnership with this uh, center uh, to tackle uh, what Nigeria said, the uh, short life uh, air pollution, pollution that are uh, also uh, uh, greenhouse gas. It is what I have to share with uh, Senegal experiences and I'm Guys, for my uh, English because it's a French speaking country. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Lamine, and thank you to all of the speakers for the great presentations. We'll jump into our final, our final session with three speakers, and it's my pleasure to introduce Jessica McCarthy, uh, representing ICCI and the University of Miami. And just a reminder to everybody to please uh, enter your questions because this will this session will, will be followed by a um, somewhat shorter question and answer period, about 20 minutes. Thank you. Jessica, are you on mute? Jessica, we cannot hear you. Yes. Hello, I am here. I apologize. There you go. Thank yeah. you. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, in these times, it can be difficult to uh, uh, contribute to international scientific work and be a parent. So I appreciate. I'm, I'm sorry, Jessica, your audio is quite low. Could you okay. either find a way to increase it or speak closer to the mic? Uh, is that better? Yeah, please continue. Yes. Hey, thank you. And and thank you again. I'm, um, it's difficult to parent and be a scientist right now, but thank you for having me today. Uh, part of my work here is um, was previewed uh, early on, uh, thinking about how to assist countries through the CCAC um, strategic planning. Um, and so I want to show you some work using remote sensing and geospatial data for open burning and emission um, in Nigeria. Um, and during this work, we also expanded to show neighboring countries um, and, of course, strategic partners in West Africa, including Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. Next slide. Um, so we wanted to test um, just how well some of our remote sensing satellite fuel products for both fire and land use could be used um, to map different types of contribution in open burning. Because while open burning is often defined as, as cropland only, um, we we know that other types of land uses are often burned for agricultural purposes. So here we have included areas that might be considered agroforestry, as commented on previously um, by the esteemed speaker from uh, Senegal, but also thinking about cropland, particularly uh, uh, rice lands, the millet, maize, the grains, uh, grasslands that could be used as pastures and shrubs areas as well. Um, and as you can see, the, the fire regime um, in Nigeria back in these last uh, five years, it really peaks um, in um, October through March. And this corresponds um, with some of the harvesting and replanting, um, but it also follows the um, natural wildfire regime. Next slide. And so here, I just want to quickly go through uh, what the pattern uh, might look like um, for uh, just a single year. So uh, I'm going to turn off my um, camera so that my audio is okay. So um, essentially, January is normally the peak month for fires. And this is kind of the pattern that we would see for fires 
at approximately 37,000. This is tw year 2019, but it's a similar level of fire from 2015 on. Um, next slide. Very, the pattern doesn't really change very much. We just see fewer fires. We don't continue. March is the next slide. And we can concentrations in the north, but also in the central and and we're starting to see um, really a clustering around cropland areas, but also some pastoral and agroforestry systems. And as we enter into April, May, um, and June, and the next slides, uh, we really start to see, <laughs> and even into July and August, these um, uh, springtime summer fires um, are, are not really occurring because um, it's hot, <laughs> and actually, uh, these are not when fires typically occur in those areas. As we enter into September, October, and November, um, we see fires start to pick up, starting in the you know, pastoral systems and then moving into some of our cropland systems. And then into finally the end of the year in December of 2019, where we start to see the pattern reemerge um, that looked so bright um, in January. But now, um, again, most of our, what we would consider any agricultural systems um, are contributing to open burning. Next slide, please. So we wanted to compare um, the map we have done, uh, which is more fine scale, with some of the global uh, fire emissions databases. And these are uh, five global fire emission databases that have been developed um, in collaboration with scientists in the EU, in the US, in Australia, and also in West Africa. Um, and this shows just 2019 open burning emissions uh, for Nigeria from the different systems. It is important to note that the blue line, which is GFED, the Global Fire Emissions Database, is often the database that is cited um, or reported in comparison with the UN FCCC emissions reporting. I mean, it happens to fall, of course, um, in the middle of these, um, these other four emission databases. QFED, which is in green, was actually developed by Dr. Charles Ichoku, Dr. Charles Ichoku formerly of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, uh, who is a Nigerian-American scientist and is currently leading um, an institute at Howard University in Washington, D.C., and he developed this fire emissions database with West Africa in mind. Um, so the green line is a little, little higher. And note that that 0 0.01 um, teragrams of annual emissions, we will come back to that. So that is the um, black carbon emissions from all open burning in Nigeria. Next slide. What we also wanted to do was to compare just how well our active fire products like Veers and Modus, which drive these global fire emissions databases, um, and often kind of um, high level policy um, and uh, climate discussions, compare to higher resolution, but also open source data. And everything presented here today is open source and, of course, available to be shared through all CCAC partners. We went ahead and found some locations of open burning and pastoral systems and hand digitized every burned area using Sentinel-2, 10 meter Sentinel-2 data, and then compared that to an automated burned area algorithm and 20 meter Sentinel-2 data. And as you can see on the left with the purple polygons, you're seeing a, a much larger amount of burned area when a human analyst um, is able to extract the burned area. Next slide. And when, we, and when we compare that to the VIRS active fire product, which of course drives most of our global fire emissions databases, our hand digitized um, analyst driven burned area product um, accounts for almost 25 square kilometers of more open burning than is detected even by um, the VIRS active fire data sets. So this is something that um, our governments and regional partners in West Africa should consider um, that in, even using these global open source active fire products, we are likely underestimating the amount of open burning. Next slide, please. And while um, we want to think about um, how these compare from our open emissions for um, Nigeria from our five data sets and then um, calculated the average of these five global emissions data sets, we wanted to show you how it also compares um, to the different methods using an analyst-driven uh, burned area in green, the Sentinel-2 burned area in orange, um, in the bar graph on the right, and the veers in purple 
Um, and so VEERS actually will give you a higher emissions um, estimate because it assumes whole pixel burns, but it doesn't give you the necessarily the right location. And, and it's really important that we get at the actual land owners, users, the, in, the indigenous and local populations that, that know the land. I also want to put these emissions in context. At 0 0.01 teragrams of black carbon, that is actually um, equivalent to one year's worth of black carbon from natural gas flaring in the Niger Delta in Nigeria, um, according to um, a study released in 2015 of 50 years worth of data of black carbon emissions um, from gas flaring. So, uh, you know, reducing open burning emissions in Nigeria. Um, will have um, an impact, and I think previous um, speakers have shown that, um, including the session led by um, Bala. Next slide. We also wanted to show some of the extended work. Um, because this is open source data and it's geospatial. When we're asked to participate in CCSD research, we try to do as much as possible. And so we did extend this work into Ghana as well. And so here we have hand digitized burned area from Sentinel-2, and then also derived from an automated burned um, area algorithm. Um, and the next slide will show the overlap of these two um, and in comparison with the VEERS FFR. And similarly, we find a, a same thing, a 27 square kilometers uh, difference. Um, but again, it's, um, we're, we're not seeing the exact same pattern when we use the active fire. We're not seeing, we're actually seeing in some places burn twice um, within the same month. Um, uh, or burn around them, um, and, and you can't gather that from the active fire data of Sentinel-2 automated. Next slide, please. Um, and so here we have the average again, uh, our hand digitized Sentinel-2 uh, burned area algorithm actually produced emissions very similar um, to that of VEERS in Ghana, as opposed, and that's because we were looking at um, a cropland system versus a pastoral system um, in Nigeria, and so it seems that the beers may actually be performing okay um, in the cropland system, but not necessarily showing a spatial pattern that a policymaker would need for intervention strategies. Next slide. And so finally, I just want to wrap up with what crops and how this impacts yields. There's there's a lot of good work going on by West African scientists um, who are in. Um, state universities within West Africa or who have now expanded into working in Chinese universities, European universities, American universities. And I want to highlight these two studies. So on the left is an example of the effect of crop residue burning on rice yield in Nigeria. Um, and what they found was that um, rice growth was actually superior um, when soils were treated with the maintained crop residue than when it was burnt. Um, and so it's it's important to think about how how you uh, go after solutions for crop residue burning and open burning so that you maintain soil health, which is of course um, an overlapping goal um, from, from all of these presentations. And then on um, your right, you will see a um, project from crop straw utilization and field burning in the northern region of Ghana. And here they found that Actually, it was not just rice, um, but what was driving the fire here was maize, sorghum, groundnuts, millet, and cowpeas, and soy as well. And so um, getting after solutions here has more to do with uh, working with farmers across a variety of um, crop um, types and, and different types, of course, management, um, tillage, um, and just needs as each, each crop variety is not the same. And what's really important as well is that they found that open burning caused a decline in yield of about from reported by uh, almost 66% of respondents. And so this is not necessarily a practice that farmers are in love with, but of course, um, like all tools for agriculture, it is a tool that has been used to reduce costs and often time. Um, and so we want to come at solutions that way as well. And so the next, and with that, um, I will uh, wrap up the presentation. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you, Jessica. Our next speaker is Achim Mwapi from the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Center, and he will be speaking on GRA's strategy for Africa. 
Thanks, uh, Lini, and um, good afternoon and evening to everyone listening. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate and speak in this important workshop. As uh, Lini has already stated, I will discuss the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases, uh, particularly its um, strategy for Africa. And I'll also explain some of the work that uh, New Zealand and other partners are doing in this forum to support country efforts to enhance agriculture and uh, climate action in Africa. Uh, just allow me to switch off um, my video to um, just um, improve internet connectivity. Uh, next, um, let me just begin by highlighting the global food cha challenge, which other speakers have already uh, alerted to. Uh, we need healthy food to feed the 9 billion people who we do project to have by 2050 within the same capacity of our Earth and uh, a very responsive and changing uh, climate. So what that slide simply shows is that we are increasing in terms of uh, population and requiring uh, better food, but the capacity of the Earth remains the same and is significantly reducing because of the challenges of climate change. On the next slide, I just wanted to highlight um, what we are as um, the Global Research Alliance. This is simply a network of governments that are interested in agricultural emissions and their effect on climate change and food security. The GRA brings countries together to find ways to grow more food without growing greenhouse gas emissions. Some of our objectives include to increase agricultural production with lower emissions and also to improve um, um, global cooperation in uh, research. As you can see from that slide, um, we currently have um, 62 member countries, 17 of which are from uh, Africa. And um, within West Africa, we have Benin, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, and uh, um, Senegal. The GRIA operations are normally through um, four key research groups. We have a research group on paddy rice research, uh, livestock research, um, crop lands research, and also we have an integrated or integrative uh, research groups which um, looks at cross-cutting issues. On my next slide, I um, just want to highlight the context in which we are working though I need to, to say that some of these points have already been uh, mentioned by other speakers. I think Lini in our introductory remarks highlighted um, some of this, so I won't spend much time on this. Maybe the only thing I could add is um, on the structure of the global agriculture sector. Unlike other sectors, uh, such as energy and transport, the agriculture sector comprises hundreds of millions of small emitters that in aggregate add up to a sizable proportion of global GHG emissions. It is estimated that there are about 570 million farms worldwide and uh, 5 million of these are of size less than two hectares. And what this means is that uh, GHG emissions from uh, agriculture comes from several small and medium farms. The implications of this is that uh, 
for any interventions to work, we need to work with each and every farmer. Unlike other sectors such as transport, where interventions we, you could only target, uh, say, big manufacturers in agriculture, every farmer's efforts count. I won't talk much about um, um, the political uh, climate and political action with respect to agriculture because that has already been um, mentioned. Maybe the only thing I could say is that um, um, whilst the number of um, um, countries have um, agriculture in their NDCs, some of the reports that have been generated, especially uh, through the FAO, show that uh, um, a larger proportion of contributions from the countries that relate to GH G emissions, there is only a small portion that have actions that explain how those targets are going to be achieved. Uh, next slide, please. On my next slide, I will just uh, talk about the challenges, and uh, these have already been um, um, mentioned by uh, uh, colleagues. I um, I think um, colleagues from Nigeria talked about the scarcity of um, um, capability and uh, capacity in many parts of the world, and also um, highlighted to the issues of um, data. So maybe the only thing I would just highlight on that or re-emphasize on that is that there are significant quantification challenges in many places and um, also a, a paucity of capability and capacities in terms of um, um, agriculture um, uh, competencies. Next slide, please. Yeah, now getting to the GRA strategy. Um, this is simply a framework of um, GRA supported action uh, in Africa. It outlines specific actions that New Zealand through the GRA and in collaboration with its partners will undertake to contribute to countries' capacity to move towards the sustainable development of their livestock sector and to countries meeting their reporting obligation under the UNF C. The GRA Africa strategy is uh, has a number of components as you can uh, uh, see from uh, uh, the figure on the uh, left, but um, it is organized under four interlinked components um, that will be undertaken in parallel. Uh, the key components include um, capacity and capability development, um, development of measurement hubs, collaborative research, and um, investment in um, partnership. I will explain these a little bit further as, uh, as we go. In terms of capacity, development this component will just just focuses on the development of pipeline um, development of a pipeline of early career scientists through a range of mechanisms for example in uh, africa we have partnered with um, um, a number of organizations including uh, the roof forum which is a network of over 135 universities to just uh, support capacity needs of um, African countries with respect to agriculture and uh, GHG um, research. Uh, with respect to the second component on um, the regional measurement hubs, we have proposed to work with established infrastructure and programs 
and to identify opportunities where additional resources would make a significant contribution to the development of regional capability to quantify GHGs from agriculture. I'm sure you will agree with me that um, um, you cannot um, mitigate what you cannot measure and hence the need for infrastructure to facilitate measurement and um, there is clearly a, a paucity of um, research infrastructure in Africa and that's one area where we want to uh, focus on. Um, there is also need for collaborative research, robust assessment of possible reductions in GI, GHG emissions associated with existing and planned agriculture development programs are able to provide as an opportunity to demonstrate progress towards fulfilling um, our in-country and uh, global commitments, including NDCs. And they could also help us to make significant contributions to the implementation of uh, global agreements such as the Paris Agreement. So specifically um, within the GRA, um, particularly under its uh, livestock uh, research group, we want to focus on um, uh, management of um, agriculture sector GHG inventories, um, collecting um, and data. I think data is a, a key area where a lot of countries are lagging behind. And then also preparation of enhanced NDCs. Next slide, please. Akim, if you could uh, finish up quickly, we're running out of time. Thank Great, you. yep. Uh, I think I'll just skip uh, that uh, slide and just uh, go to the next one to highlight um, some of the progress that we have made um, in um, advancing these um, in Africa. We have, um, we currently have uh, three uh, awards and scholarship programs running, the Cliff Grads, um, which um, so far we have um, trained close to over 140, 124 PhD students. And um, currently we are running the Ruforum um, Award uh, grant system with um, the network of universities that I earlier mentioned. Then the next thing that we are focusing on, highlighted on my last um, slide, uh, we've been partnering with um, a pharma institution, a pharma organization. Like I said, in this field, we need to work with every pharma. And we are also increasing understanding of currently available and collected um, in-country activity data for tier two estimates of livestock emissions. And this is a project including or involving 39 sub-Saharan African countries. And lastly, um, we have been trying to get more members um, organized. These are in-country um, uh, partnerships and um, just, um, um, having more people participate in the GRA research groups. I'm, I'm going to end there and just um, uh, invite you to contact me for uh, the GRA secretariat for any further information. Thank you very much. I'll end there. Excellent. Thank you, Akim. And now I'm pleased to introduce Wynne Ellis, the Executive Director of the Sustainable Rice Platform. Thank you very much. Um, good day, everybody. Um, it's an honor, honor to be here. And thank you again, um, CCAC, Linny, Catalina, for the invitation to be here. I was asked to provide a short briefing on the Sustainable Rice Platform, um, its goals and how it operates and how it might be relevant to the West African context. And some previous speakers have already mentioned the SRP in, in their presentations. Um, next slide, please. Um, Linny has contextualized it, contextualized it well in her introduction, 
Um, we've heard a lot of just a lot of discussion today about about the tech about technologies and impacts, and I'm going to be talking instead about the institutional context and how we can take best practice and scale it up um, to essentially transform um, the global rice sector. Um, so let's start with the problem statement and the observation, I suppose, that rice presents us with not one, but two paradoxes. While providing a, a cheap, defendable source of food for half the world's population, it also has the largest carbon footprint as of all food crops, as we know. At its current size, rice has a CO2 equivalent to the country of Germany or the entire global aviation industry, pre-COVID anyway. Um, so by whatever metric you choose, as you've seen the slide here, the sustainability, sustainability impact of rice dwarfs those of all the high profile commodities that have attracted global attention from both business and the international development community over the past 20 years. And it's, it's amazing that rice has actually come to the fore only recently in the sustainability debate. Um, next slide, please. When we talk about consumption, um, the challenge, um, it seems from the projections of the Asian Development Bank and OECD and, and FAO as well, by and large, if you triangulate these projections, it looks like we're going to need at least 25% more rice to meet projected future global demand, whilst min minimizing the sustainability footprint. And that also takes into account reducing per capita consumption as well as dietary sh diets shift. Um, so yeah, um, next slide, please. However, next slide, please. Against that backdrop, in Africa, where we have witnessed over the past five years, the world's most rapid growth in rice production, in consumption and imports. We've also, we also see a massive incidence of water scarcity and projections of much worse to come. So in Africa, especially, when we sustainable best practice in rice-based farming systems has to be a top policy consideration of, um, as well as within the international development community. And indeed, the I think the, 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 the tone of the presentations I've heard today indicates that this is very much um, climbing up on the agenda um, because, of course, the water agenda is so inextricably linked to the climate change conversation too. So, next slide, please. The Sustainable Rice Platform, with this challenge in mind, was conceived in um, about in 20, 2011, actually, by UNEP and IRI, along with some private sector partners, GIZ was also involved, to address this rice paradox. Why was rice so neglected in the sustainability stakes? How could we provide a framework for increasing production um, in a sustainable way? Um, it grew from a small group of about 12 organizations, and this was before I joined, actually, to its current um, size. Um, we now have about uh, just over 100 global um, public, private, and, and civil society organizations. And, you know, we have this aim to really transform the global rice sector through a number of different types of intervention. Um, next slide, please. So we work basically, you know, to boost livelihoods of rice smallholders, to reduce the water and, and climate change footprints of rice, uh, to foster new market linkages for sustainable rice, and also provide entry points to contribute to sustainable development goals. And this is this is particularly obvious. You know, we're hosted within UNEP, and you can see um, a lot of the a lot of components in the program of work within UNEP have linkages to you know where rice could really contribute and, and and we've seen you know discussions about how agriculture has 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 only recently achieved uh, entered the conversation in in discussions of ndcs um we've also focused in the past on asia and southeast asia south and southeast asia as being you know the main producers of rice um, we are now really turning turning our attention much more to Africa, and there have been a number of developments institutionally. ECOWAS is involved, the World Bank is involved, as we know, Islamic Development Bank has also has some major interventions in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, next slide, please. Okay, sorry, could you go back one? I, I need to say a little more about that last slide. Um, yeah, so the ways we work, how do we how do we drive this transformation? Well, we do it. First thing we did was to develop 
normative tools, and this is the standard and performance indicators. Uh, Akib said it well just now. He said you can't met, you can't you can't mitigate what you can't measure. So we we provide basically an agreed working definition of sustainability in the rice in in rice farming and a means of measuring it, measuring it and monitoring it, monitoring the impacts that can be then linked to SDGs. In the private sector, in fact, we're just about to launch um, our SRP verified assurance scheme, which will bring um, sustainable rice to supermarket shelves um, initially in Europe, but hopefully in Asia as well, where we see much more likelihood of, of, of actual retailer premiums being applied. Um, thirdly, we work through scaling projects, um, bilaterals and multilaterals. You can see the alphabet soup there. Um, I'll say a little bit more about a, a larger scale consortium that we have set up uh, again as a as a means of driving the, the SRP agenda. Um, you know, through the through the influence of these larger scale uh, organisations, uh, international organisations. Okay, uh, we are also part of the UNEP Sustainable Food Systems Task Force, which takes us into an intergovernmental into the in, intergovernmental conversation. Next slide, please. So, what do we see um, as a, as impacts? We've we've tested the standard implementation in a number of different countries. Iri analyzed this work in 2017, and what was interesting was, whilst there was, you know, these these are not you know robust longitudinal studies, but what was what what struck me was that everything was pointing in the same direction. We were achieving similar kinds of results in all these different cultural contexts. So significant reduction in emissions in, in, in flooded rice systems, savings in water use or, and pumping costs, reductions in chemical use, and overall then increases in farmer incomes. We're not, we're not claiming here, we didn't see increases in yields, although this has been claimed um, by, some, by some of our partners. Um, I, I, I think it's probable this, this will happen, but we don't have the evidence yet. But you can see this, this is worth shooting for. So, you know, um, what we'd like to see very much, and we would love to have your collab collaboration on this, is to do actually a lot more work on, you know, developing the evidence base uh, for implementation of, of uh, sustainable best practice in rice. Um, yeah, next, please. I want to say a little bit more. Next slide. Yeah, a little bit more about the um, assurance scheme that we are we are just about to launch. Um, this is very new and will will actually be released next week to support our value chain partners. Um, and you know, having worked on on the upstream end of, of uh, for for three four years to ensure that we have tools that support farmer livelihoods and make a significant difference in environmental and climate change metrics. We also now create the consumer demand and involve the downstream actors to ensure that that kind of incentivizes long-term upstream change. Um, so the scheme is managed in collaboration with Global Gap, who I think most of you will be familiar with. They, they manage a lot of different proprietary standards um, and have, you know, have very robust governance structures to support you know, the assurance um, claim. Um, so it provides value chain transparency and also market differentiation. And these are these this combination of public sector development um, interventions and private sector uh, activities, we hope will will help to drive to, to, to build traction and build support um, in, in a kind of broad based way. Next, please. Um, so, you know, if we have these tools available, if we are working on the farm, if we are providing the definition, the normative tools, if we're, if we're, if we're building awareness with, among retailers, how do we drive this collective impact that we seek? Next slide, please. Um, we really need to um, uh, develop scaling initiatives in the, the public and the development arena. Um, and here, I just wanted to you know, highlight this initiative that we put together a couple of years ago. Six organizations came together to develop proposals under, under GEF 7. Um, it's a global impact program. Um, we have already, um, through, through UNEP and, um, and FAO as the implementing GEF implementing agencies, 
uh, we have put in um, proposals in I think five or six countries and raised um, uh, indicative grant funding of about fifty million dollars. Um, and these projects are now at the PPB, PPG stage, so they're in the design stage. Um, we think this is a promising avenue to drive sectoral transformation because it involves government agencies. It, it, it requires the buy-in of government agencies. They all have SRP as the core theory of change within them. Um, you know, and so so we're very excited about this. But the important thing about this initiative is that it takes SRP off um, um, away from just as a farm level initiative and takes it into you know into the realm of systems thinking. And we start to talk about landscapes and how you know rice. You don't just talk about rice as a single commodity, but you talk about its role within the overall agro ecosystem. And we're finding out, we're feeling our way. We don't have all the answers. We don't have landscape landscape level indicators set up yet. So there's a wealth of opportunity, I think, for research in all of this. Um, yeah, and last slide, please. Next slide, I mean, <laughs> which is the last slide. Um, I hope this has given you a brief snapshot of the sustainable rice platform. We are increasingly um, turning our focus to Africa, as I mentioned, and our uh, very excited at the interest and engagement that we've seen at country and regional level so far. I would I would shout out to Nigeria and uh, and Cote d'Ivoire, which are going to become members as governmental members of SRP. Everyone is welcome. You know, you just have to write to me. Um, and we look forward to working with you both at policy and farm level. And we would love to hear from you if you have an interest in working on, you know. Uh, research um, into impacts of adoption. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wynne. So now we turn to our question and answer session. Please do put your questions into the question and answer box. Uh, the chat is also a possibility. Uh, so we have a fantastic question from Madeline Meyer um, saying, thank you very much. Many of the panelists mentioned issues related to developing bankable project proposals and the need to find funding for interventions. And she's asking, has anybody looked at the estimated funds needed versus the funds available? In other words, what's the funding gap? Um, so that's a question for any of our panelists. And please just jump in, turn off your mic and, and hop in, even if you say no. I, uh, hi, this is Wynne. Um... Uh, we actually commissioned uh, or worked together with the Earth Security Group uh, last year to look at um, finance in the rice sector. Um, what role could the financial community um, contribute to transport to making this transformation? Um, I can share the report of that uh, with all of you. Uh, it was actually launched at, at COP25 in Madrid, um, and we are still working on on questions relating to well, how can we operationalize this. With, where, where you see a green bond market that is saturated for all for, for all kinds of commodities, but no one's investing in rice. So it's an opportunity uh, for investors, but it's also an opportunity to actually make a difference um, for the financial community. I don't have an answer on the funding gap other than it, it, it is huge. <laughs> um, uh, but I think the blueprints that were offered in the ESG report might be might well be of interest in terms of um, structuring financial instruments such as bonds, trusts, and blended finance. Thank you, and we can be sure to circulate that to the participants. Okay, I'll send, I'll send yeah. it to you right now. <laughs> Thank you. Would anybody else like to comment? Um. Yes, please. Um, uh, this is uh, Kim. Um, not not really um, to answer the question the way it was. It's a very um, intelligent and uh, good question. But all I wanted to say is that um, within the agriculture sector, especially livestock sector, there is underinvestment. I would give an example in um, um, 2017. Um, they, there was about um, 180 billion um, dollars dispersed to developing countries, and only 
0.1% of that went to agriculture. So clearly there is a gap and um, um, a paucity of investment in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. We have a couple of questions specifically to Lamine. Uh, the first is from Akiko Nagano asking about what kind of compost, what was the material, how is it made and by whom? And then also for Lamine, uh, uh, a question from, uh, let's see, I can't tell who it's from, uh, that is, uh, can you come back to the agro silva pastoral law for Senegal and how it can benefit the livestock sector? And very brief answers if possible. Thank you. Okay, th okay, thank you, Catalina, for, uh, and Mohammed for this uh, question. As I have mentioned, uh, uh, in some countries uh, like Senegal, uh, uh, we have both uh, agriculture, forestry, and livestock sector that have to be managed in a comprehensive manner. And uh, the sector is also uh, related to land use system, and sometimes land tenure is very important in the country because uh, it is source of many problems. So to keep uh, a very comprehensive development pathway in Senegal, uh, we have worked in uh, a very global law, and it is uh, the law of uh, a silver pastoral law, which is established uh, to enhance the development in agriculture sector and to keep integration between agriculture, forestry, land use and uh, livestock and uh, the purpose is to reduce poverty to ensure food security but also to keep uh, an environment of uh, concertation about uh, land tenure and from this law we have many action plans uh, one action plan uh, for agricultural development another action plan on uh, forestry development and one for livestock development and from this uh, uh, livestock development plan, we have set up what we call uh, the National Livestock Development Plan, PND, uh, Plan National Development de uh, l'Elevage, which now becomes the first uh, component of uh, livestock in the PS, uh, the Plan Senegal Emergent. So this, uh, uh, this situation or this is an issue uh, or a benefit of the first work done uh, in the uh, agro silver pastoral uh, development uh, law. I don't know if I have uh, I given a very clear uh, answer on that. And uh, the second question is about uh, compost use. If I have understood, Catalina. That's correct. Yeah, okay, thank you. In our uh, NDC, we have uh, uh, we do, if, if you see in mitigation action, mitigation area in Senegal NDC, you will not see the livestock area because it is very difficult uh, with our social uh, traditional livestock systems to have uh, mitigation actions. But in terms of uh, methane emission in uh, enteric fermentation, but we have one option in uh, manual management by using uh, biogas. Uh, bio disasters and uh, for a coherence purpose uh, and uh, to be aligned with the IPCC uh, guidelines uh, this option is just shifted to energy sector that's why you will not see it here and when we are uh, when we will be implementing this uh, bio disasters and bio biogas uh, options you will have the production of biogas but also the production of manure uh, very important, uh, high quality manure, and it will be used in agriculture. And uh, in our NDC, this is a part of energy option, power option, which will be also uh, having impact on agriculture by using uh, this manure on uh, market gardening systems, because uh, they are very important in our uh, farming systems. And to have also to see how uh, farmers will be using uh, many type of uh, manure uh, from uh, organic uh, matter uh, to use uh, what we call the compost 
systems, as far composters in French, and to improve uh, the quality of the manual uh, to be added in uh, to reduce the use of uh, chemical fertilizers. It is a way uh, we are using uh, for our NDC because NDC is also integrated in um, uh, what we call integrated environment. Environment integrity, yeah, thank you. Fantastic, thanks so much. We've run out of time. We will follow up with others of you who have asked questions uh, separately after this meeting. I just want to really thank all of our panelists and also the audience for attending. It's been a very information rich um, conversation, uh, especially to help us understand the synergies between synergies between technology and research. Technology and research. Absolutely on the road. Absolutely on the road. Absolutely. And to which thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Yeah. Yes. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very Goodbye. much to everybody. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.